And we're live, so to speak. We're live. Actually, this is recorded, so if we're watching this, it's actually, this is already in the past, but. This just happened, though, so it's still fresh, everybody. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> I'm James, and, and I'm here Dave. with David. And uh, we are both excited to be presenting at HypnoThoughts coming up uh, in July, you know, a couple weeks away from now. And, uh, you know, the two of us became friends a while ago, and we're kind of in a similar camp in the hypno world. We're more on the clinical hypnosis and we're very much evidence-based uh, thinkers in this space. And both of our topics touch on that. So David, tell us about your presentation. What's the name and what are you talking about? All right. So I'm Dave Ruby and my topic is evidence-based hypnosis. And essentially making this brief, I uh, my background, for those who don't know me, is uh, medical research. I was a medical librarian for about uh, 11 and a half years, and that's how I got into this field. And I was actually a skeptic um, in what I did. Basically, I'd heard about hypnosis and I researched it. And this is kind of an expansion or an evolution of that, where essentially I'm looking at what evidence there is behind hypnosis, how to find it, how to evaluate it, uh, and why you might care. Uh, so a lot of it's going to be about looking at like what are the sources, what's the evidence for hypnosis, how do you even like track it down or filter through it. Uh, and also, I think this is important. How do you kind of combine the art and the science? Uh, this is not meant to be like degrading or, you know, denigrating, if you will, to the art or your anecdotal experience as much as how you blend the science out there, what we know, what we can find out with what you've learned and what you experience with the client. So again, that blend of art and science from an evidence-based perspective. That's pretty good in a nutshell, I think. That's great. Fantastic. And so you've got one hour, which day are you presenting? I'm the, uh, I like to say I'm the headliner of uh, day three. I'm Love like the it. very last, right now I'm the very last slot on the very last day. Awesome. Okay. So it's so like Ozzy Ozfest, you know, with yeah, less, yeah, you know, totally. less, <laughs> less cutting, uh, eating heads of bats. I'll, I'll less eating heads of bats. 100% less. 100% less. That's right. You heard it here. This is breaking news. <laughs> well, I'll be there. Looking forward to it. Excellent. So uh, tell me about your presentation a little bit, which I, I know a little bit about, but for those who haven't been talking to you, give us the rundown. Yeah. So mine is called the Four Diamonds of Clinical Hypnosis, and it's a framework to bridge what's happening in contemporary, very current neuroscience with uh, the medical community. I work on an interdisciplinary team with uh, doctors and nurses and social workers, et cetera, uh, in elder care. And uh, so I work with folks with dementia, complex mental health issues, and that population is living longer and um, it's given me some insight into how the middle-aged brain functions by seeing what happens uh, when the brain begins to degrade. So I'm presenting a, a model for clinical hypnosis that is 100% not Freudian at all. I go back to the moment in time when um, who they call the father of modern neuroscience, his name is Santiago Ramon y Cajal, when he and Freud kind of split and went in different directions, they were contemporaries. And so I traced the model of Cajal forward so that really, if you like Ernest Rossi and that line of work, I'm really building off of Rossi's work with what he called transduction, which is a great medical term. It's how different body systems communicate with each other. Uh, so that's the quick nutshell. It's a very deep dive. Uh, it's two hours. I promise to make it a lot of fun. We're going to play bingo one way or another, because that's <laughs> strangely, I never thought I'd be playing bingo for a living, but that is part of what I do in my day job, making people feel safe, loved, reoriented uh, in a dementia care setting. So hey, if that interests a book you, on that. That'd be a great topic for like an actual book. <laughs> so I am writing a that. book. The nice thing about, I really want to thank the HypnoThoughts community. It's kind of been a workshop for me, a place to present. This will be my second time presenting it. The book is getting closer and closer to completion. Uh, you know, it's it's a challenging thing to write about, but the very good news 
or the community is our work collectively as hypnotists crafting a way to work with people is very much supported by contemporary neuroscience agreed and uh, in in a way that doesn't rely on the metaphysical or the things you can't prove or you could say the woo i think we have a strong basis to be present uh, as part of medical teams and so that's the argument that i'm trying to make with the team that i'm currently on in my day job and in a larger sense that in some ways uh, psychology took us out into the wrong areas and it's time to pull us back the philosophers call that a demarcation problem if you've ever heard of that and the famous Karl Popper the philosopher talks about that that's getting into the details but it's time to move that line and put us um we're closer to bio than even psychology is and that's the argument I'm making Ooh, how about that <laughs> I, like I had a thought actually as we we're talking or as I was listening to you one thing I'll um one thing I'll talk about my approach first, not to, it, this will make sense, but I think yeah. my approach is about questioning and seeking information. And anyone who's taken countless classes, you may fall into that. I like the idea of being able to research what's out there, how the brain works, what we know now, being yeah. creative about how things work and making sense of that. What I like about your approach that I hadn't thought about until just now is you actually have taken things and synthesized it for something we can use now. I oh, tend yeah. to like to look for um, for solutions to things or where we know about things and incorporate into my own practice and how I understand things and what I do. You've actually kind of created a nice structure for like, here's understanding now based on history of neurology and science, psychology, et cetera. Here's something you can use based on the evidence as we understand it now. And I think my approach is um, it's similar in that it's evidence-based. I, I actually do research the journals, but I've yeah. cast kind of a wide net kind of like see what feeds into what I'm doing now as opposed to like, here's like something more concise. And I think that's something I think that's we're doing the same kind of thing. Like I couldn't do what I do if, uh, if it were not for your approach, uh, you know, scanning the journals, um, which I got to say initially does seem daunting uh, to anyone that tries to do it, but you know, yeah, there's a learning curve to this, but um there's only so many um, avenues out there and you start to see, okay, um, there's absolutely legitimate research in the neuroscience on uh, in clinical hypnosis. And you're going to hear terms like phenomenological control coming out more and more a lot of, and that's uh, uh, Zoltan Dinas's work with Peter Lush, who I've been talking to, um, that in hypnotists have known this for a long time. We have the ability to kind of put on rose colored glasses, right? Yeah. Or you see somebody walking under a cloud. Um, that's phenomenological control. In other words, the phenomenon that are in the world that we apprehend through our senses, uh, we have, um, let's call it an interface relationship with that. It, we don't take in our senses as they are, we right. have a color we put to everything. A lot of research on that right now. Um, and if I hadn't taken your kind of approach, I wouldn't have come across this. I would have been scared of it. And I thought instead, you know what? I'm going to try to disprove hypnosis, falsify it from the start. And as I did this, like, no, we're, we're on solid footing, but nobody's framed it that way because we got stuck under uh like an offshoot of psychology which is yeah. it's not even wrong <laughs> it's so off off base so it's a this i'm proposing a restart we'll see how well that goes i might propose a slightly different frame than that i okay. think it's part of the fear is that you have to like go and get your phd in like psychology and research clinical research psychology to start this which i don't think is at all the case i think you can look at um, no, you don't. Yeah, Anybody but there are people that have done that work for it. Like you can look at like yes. some review articles. Or there are names that have done the research for us. Um, I would argue that it would be useful for us to have some base knowledge of what people have done. I'll throw out some names like Irving Kirsch is very prominent. Yes. Response um, expectancy is awesome. 
Right. That our brains are feeding us what's coming next, what it thinks we want, or what it's habituated to us doing. Sure. Does that work for hypnotists? Of course. That's such a great frame. But there even, are people. Go ahead. Well, even so, Irving Kirsch is very famous for a lot of things, one of them being his notion that hypnosis is a type of response expectancy. And he had a, let's say, a colleague or a critic named Nick Spanos who I love. tried to have, what's that? Who I love. I love Nick Spanos. Yeah, he had kind of an opposite view. And I try to synthesize them because, so Nick Spanos's view was that hypnosis is social compliance. And so that explains, you know, maybe I'm simplifying it, but a, a bit, but yeah, go um, that out in the world, we behave the way it makes sense for us to behave in a given environment and situation. So walking in the grocery store, you're not behaving the way you do at a sporting event. Hopefully. And <laughs> so people get pretty wild in the grocery store. I don't know if you get noticed pretty that. wild. Yeah. So, you know, that explains like the mass hysteria effect or being on a game show and being bonkers, but in real life, you're a mild mannered accountant, um, that sort of thing. Um, the thing they both view, so in response expectancy is an internally generated idea that here's what my body needs for me to do next. I'm getting ready to work out. I better spike my blood pressure, heart rate, breathing, et cetera um they are both predict they are both aspects of prediction one's socially based one's internally based um that corresponds really well um to interoception exteroception and stuff i'm going to talk about again getting into the weeds because yeah. you and i can can do this yes. but if you look at every uh, idea that folks have come up with about hypnosis and you plot them out on a as a field uh, which is part of what I do you get a really interesting view from doing that instead of saying this version disproves that idea about hypnosis yeah. by plotting them out it's much closer to blind men describing an elephant where everybody's got a piece of the truth so that that ends up being part of what I'm writing about is saying, OK, let's let's look at what's true about Spanos, what's true about Kirsch, what's true about the non-state folks, what's true about the state position and right. uh, getting some interesting stuff from that. One thing and I'll, I'll speak on Spanos. This is I'll keep this brief for the, the people that may be watching this. Um, we, we have. There was a discussion recently on Facebook of all places. And if you haven't argued with strangers on Facebook, my gosh, it's the one most horrible thing in the world. Um, oh, but one of the things hypnotists can agree upon is that we have absolutely zero agreement about what hypnosis is or how it works. Yeah. You ask a thousand hypnotists what hypnosis is and how it works, and you'll get about a thousand answers, or if not more. Yes. Uh, but I think what this does- Which is helps, a problem. Yeah, honestly. Let's be real. Yeah. I think what this, what I think the importance or one of the important pieces of this is, is as we test things clinically, it kind of shows us how things work when they're in controlled environments. Yeah. Uh, like one of the myths, I'll say it's a myth, is that you have to, um, when I first learned hypnosis, there is, I, first thing I learned was you have to zone them through the floor, that you know, they have to get deep enough to make change. And then literally about a month or two later, I found hypnosis without trance and like, what the hell? How can this be yeah. true? Uh, and one of the things Spanos found, and not to like name drop him so much, is that trance, like depth of trance is very subjective and it's not objective. And one of the things Spanos kind of argued, and I, I would argue proved, is to make change, you don't have to get people in a certain level of trance. Right. Now, the artistic side is that, and maybe some more objective things, but generally, if you don't need to get a certain depth of trance, that it's totally subjective to the client and their, frankly, their expectations, then... If we don't need it, why focus so much on it? Now, there might be reasons right. to actually focus on depth of trance experience. I think what's important is not not depth. It's the change of states that we cycle somebody through. Right. So, you know, they're in a certain state when the problem happened. They're in a different state when they're in a resource state, as we like to say. Yeah. And we're experts at cycling folks in and out 
and then they notice what else was salient, what else was important when they were in that state that they didn't realize, and this is what they'd like to be like. So in that sense, it's state or non I'm on team state, by the way. I just I'm, I'm obviously more a team process, which is great. And see, yeah, we're actually able to engage. But I think it's the change that that we have developed as a craft, as a field. Uh, the meta pattern holds really rings true. Um, that matches up with what's called adaptive resonance theory, which is a uh, model for how our neurology goes back and forth between our senses picking up new information, our memory telling us what it thinks is going to happen because we're constantly doing that. If you don't, if your body doesn't need a lot of wattage to get up in the middle of the night and go use the bathroom, why fire up all of your sensory info? If you've got a, you know, a good memory map of how to do that. And, you know, all of us do in our own houses, there's no reason to um, utilize the wattage it takes to, you know, fire up all your senses, unless you step on a Lego right that's and then you got to posturally reposition and take care of your balance and go why did that happen and right you know then you're using a lot of wattage but we're set up to use the minimal amount <laughs> and this, for, so anyone this watching, the... for anyone watching this is good because it, it the more we know this kind of stuff you don't have to be like a, a doctor or like have a phd in you know bio biology and neuropsychology this helps us learn how the brain works so we can see why yeah. what we're doing might work or if it, if it doesn't show up in the clinical stuff, like why, why is it working for me and not showing up in the research? Uh, I think that, I think we're getting a better idea of how our brains and minds work. Also, another point that I think is important is uh, right now we're largely a part of, or apart from rather the medical community. Most people aren't going to go to a doctor and have hypnosis or meditation even prescribed as treatment or as a, you know, as a yeah. boost. One of my um, ulterior motives is I would love to see hypnosis be more integrated. I'm seeing that's, that's what, yeah, we are absolutely in lockstep on that. Yeah. You know, if you go to a doc and they can prescribe acupuncture, we have, we meet a higher threshold than acupuncture as far as I can tell. I think, so, yeah, I, know, I have to, a, a not bit to of pick a... on another field, but. No. Uh, one of the things I did when I was a librarian, my medical librarian, is I would research for the largely physical therapy department. And I did research on acupuncture and acupressure. And yeah. I'll make this short, but what I found is, one, there's evidence supporting some of those things, like some things more than others. And hypnosis is not, uh, it's very evidence-based in that there's a lot of research behind it. Not all of it's great, um, but I, I, I did find that if you could find enough randomized control trials or meta-analyses or systematic yes. reviews or enough quality research and show it to someone they'll they'll give it a shot um so that's what yeah. the president of the hospital i worked at was interested in insurance companies they want something more than just a blurb on a website frankly or one or two case studies they want right. something to a higher standard because they're paying for it um, yeah. that and if anyone's let's say someone you love is sick or if you have an injury you're going to want something in all likelihood i'll make this assumption you want what's got the most evidence saying this will actually work. Yeah. And you want good stuff. You don't yeah. want like a snake oil salesman. You want someone who's like, this has been proven based on this research and all these case studies and you know, reviewed ones. Too, Where we get into the challenges are what are the mechanism? What's the causality? You know, but we can't always explain that for anesthesia either. We, we know it works and we rely on it. And things like Clinical hypnosis is very dependent on the person's ability to safely imagine, and that's not the case for every person that's out there. Like anything else, um, you know, I work with a lot of schizophrenics in my day job, and for a lot of them, uh, it can be dangerous to imagine. They tend to lock into a concrete worldview because that's what keeps them safe, and you know, but we, we can, we're getting a little into the weeds. Let's wrap up and say, uh, we hope that this has an audience. Uh, you know, we're, we're maybe a little camp in um, the hypnothoughts world. If you're part of this camp, 
come on down if you're a doctor, a nurse, if you're involved in the medical community at all, if you're just interested in this kind of thing, you know, hey, if you think we're wrong, <laughs> I don't know, come anyway. Like, you know, I've had great dis- I've had great discussions with people who um who wanted not to want to argue, but people who had different opinions. Yeah, I yeah. think it's great. Honestly, I genuinely enjoy having like civil discussions where we can present dis- you know disagreements. Yeah. So come on by, say hello. Uh, and we'll see you guys in a few weeks. Right on. Right. Sounds great. Thanks, David. Thanks, James. See you at Thoughts. See you there. Bye.